Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Joy Project. My name is Krista Abampato, and I am so excited to have you with us today. We have a real treat today. I would like you to meet Eric Fisher. Eric, welcome to The Joy Project. Thank you so much for having me. It's, 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 I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. to be here. Eric, can you tell us where you're joining us from today? I am currently sitting in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, so it's about a suburb just south of Nashville. I love yeah. Nashville, one of my favorite, favorite cities. It's a fun town. Yes, I have, and we actually met because you are so close to Nashville, and we met as part of the Story community, which is That's a right. really great community of storytellers of all different kinds. Um, Eric, what is the kind of storytelling that you do mostly in what medium? Audio and in written form are the two primary uh, modes of my storytelling practice. Uh, so I have a little kind of storytelling venture that I'm working with right now that I, I record and moderate um, conversations and about people's life stories. So to hear just their life through their eyes and their voice and to preserve that for themselves and for their family. Um, that's the primary thing, but uh, among other things like blogging and, and reflective pieces, movie reviews is a big part of my life. So stories everywhere, and I, I'm probably not qualified to talk about it all the time, but it's 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 a uh, I love it. So that's so great. I love that. Have you been doing that for a long time, recording on um, people's life stories? Yeah, it's been just under three years now that I've been doing that. Oh, fantastic! Are there any stories? When you think about all the stories you've recorded, any that particularly stand out for you? Yeah, it's tough. I, I Full disclosure, uh, for you and the listeners, I, I struggle with favorites in general, and this probably reaches out to this question too. Every every story is such a, a gift. I think... Um, I think of maybe two things. One, one is the the emotion and the, the therapeutic uh, quality of sharing your story. Even if you know me or don't know me, there's there's power in kind of rehashing um, different life events, good, bad, or indifferent. There's there's just a just a really cool poignant piece to that. But I also think of you know, kind of highlights of of can't quite believe it. Uh, I, I didn't. A life story of of a guy that did forty thousand miles of of hitchhiking um, uh, as a conscientious objector of the Vietnam War and and all the stories while he was looking for peace, love, and happiness. And in the truest sense, uh, he would have been a hippie, uh, but was looking for something deeper than than the strobe lights and parties. So, like that that story was wild, you know, <laughs> really beautiful. So that's kind of what I think. Yes, and so he hitchhiked for forty thousand miles, and he was telling you the story of the people he met along the way. Yeah, and that when time failed to to catch every person uh, that, that he encountered, mm -hmm. but yeah, just the journey, his his own self discovery while he was meeting people where they were, and and just the kind of the the nature of being picked up by a stranger, uh, what that would what that meant to him. That's amazing. Oh, I love that, Eric. If people want to hear those stories, are they available anywhere in an archive or are they really for the people that you're recording them from? And they're like private to those people. Yeah, a little both. Um, okay. So the, the, I do have a product that is out there that people could purchase and kind of collaborate with me that, that reflects kind of what we're talking about. But mm -hmm. uh, that one is very private. That one's just kind of for the, for the people I do have. There was a season where I did public versions of it, where I had maybe a podcast length Yep. kind of audio cut where they could hear snippets of the gist of the story. And then I did like a, um, a shorthand uh, transcribing and summary of, of the story. So those are still available. I have a Patreon that, that houses those, but also my website and, and the, co the company's name is weird. It's, it's finer creations and I made up the word. So it's F I N O W R.com. So if F I N O W R.com. Yep. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to check that out. I didn't realize that you made any of those conversations public. So that's so there are a few. There's, I think there's 13 of them that are. Oh, uh, awesome. A whole season. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about joy. And when you reached out to me and said you wanted to be a guest and the thing that brought you joy, I thought was so, it was such a beautiful, beautiful way that you put it. And also that it's so poignant, especially for what we have lived through in this pandemic and how challenging it's been for people. And then also what we are continuing to live through. You know, we didn't just come out the other side of the pandemic and okay, great. Like now yeah. we're, you know, everyone said, <laughs> oh, now we're back. Now we're getting back to normal. It, right. I really do feel like this was a big step change for the world, mm -hmm. you know, in our lives in 2019, there, there's sort of this grieving and this mourning of, I loved my 2019 life <laughs> and, oh, sure. parts, and parts of that life will come back 
and parts of that will never come back. You know, there is this real change that I think uh, I'm certainly going through and, and a lot of people are going through. And so I wanted to talk to you today um, about that subject and, and ask and start by asking you what, what brings you joy? How are you finding joy, you know, maybe in this difficult transition time? Yeah, I'm, I'm just in a season of appreciation for me uh, right now. Um, and, and, and my story is, is probably, everyone says their story is unique and, and it is true. Um, yeah. Mine is probably a, a little bit different. I'm, I'm in such a, a season of transition in a lot of different ways. And I've, I've seen that kind of building over the last couple of years and, and only heightened the awareness and expedited that growth and, and movement because of all of the things that you just mentioned, pandemic, conflict, yeah. social, emotional health conversations, all those things are really important and, and contributed. I think, I think I'm just able right now or trying to be more more aware and able to look at my circumstances the chapter of my story right now and be grateful for it and i'm just more aware of the friendships the connections that i have the blessings the the privilege that I, that i've been afforded uh, across all of those definitions um, and and looking at it and saying this this is joyful even if it changes this this moment that i have right now is is a is a pretty cool thing uh, the, the days that i'm lazy on the couch it's joyful the days that i'm really productive and connecting is joyful you know so mm-hmm. the, the days that i'm I'm really having a hard time or frustrated because of, of people or places or things. It, there's still joy to be found there. Um, yes. So mm-hmm. I've, I've, I think I'm just trying to, to zoom out of what, what we have for so long looked at joy and happiness being so closely intertwined and, and, and finally seeing it more definitively as separate, separate concepts. Yes, I totally agree. And it's one of those things that it felt a little bit strange to me, as I mentioned, I've been thinking about this project for a long time. It started as a short film. Filming got difficult during the pandemic. And I wanted to really reach out to people who didn't live in New York. You know, so many people were leaving New York at that time. Sure. And also there's so many fantastic stories everywhere. And I really wanted to be able to, to celebrate that and embrace that. And at the same time, it it felt a little bit uncomfortable to me at first that I was doing a project about joy because the world was so difficult. And did we really have a right to express joy, find joy, create joy? Was that okay in a time where there was a lot of suffering? And I really struggle with exactly what you just said of that idea of joy and happiness. And, and they're, they're not the same. You know, that we can and should actively seek out joy, especially when we're not happy, especially yeah. when times are really, really difficult. I went through a really difficult health challenge when I was diagnosed with cancer and I'm thankfully I'm, I'm cancer free and, and better and healthy again. But it was part of that journey was every day finding joy. It was really like this practice, like this muscle of like, oh, I got to go to chemo today, (laughs) Right. but I've also got to find a way to be happy. I've also Mm got to find a way to find joy, even if I can't be happy all day, even if there are things that are really frightening to me, I've still got to, I've still got to find that. And the thing for me that your response to the, that prompt of what brings you joy. And you said, I am finding joy in the unknown. And that to me was just so beautiful. And I'm like, I have got to talk to Eric (laughs) about the joy of the unknown. Like you said, you're in this transition period. A lot of people are in this transition period and really trying to find our footing again. And it's, it's challenging, even sometimes on a day-to-day basis. Like we think we got it figured out and then something else happens. And so I was wondering if you could talk about one, the joy of the unknown and sort of what that means to you. And then also, how are you finding it? Like, what is that practice for you of if the unknown is uncomfortable, how, how are you finding joy even in moments of, of um, discomfort? Yeah, Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Joy of the unknown is, is, is such a fascinating concept. And I I am a a theoretical thinker. Um, So I'm not as good. I want to first say, I'm not as good at being a doer as I am, a philosophizer. <laughs> uh, I like, I, I'm a thinker. I like to, to really, and I'm an enthusiast. So I'm, I'm going to try to approach these questions, understanding that people are different and will encounter joy in the unknown differently than I, what I'm presenting. Uh, and I see it in a couple of different levels. So on, on one level, I'm looking at joy 
from a definition standpoint, as we've already kind of talked about, as in a very intentional act yeah. um, and, and an approach to, to finding joy in that sense. So to, to embrace contentment and peace while you're discovering it. Kind of like this, this phrase of, I can't wait to see how this turns out. As a storyteller, and I met you in a storytelling conference, yes. what I, I love stories forever, but when I started learning about the nuts and bolts of, of narrative structure, when I understood that conflict was necessary for a good story, that changed things for me. Every good story needs to have conflict in order for it to be joyful in the end as we finish the, the book or watch the credits roll. Yeah. Otherwise, we've just wasted our time because it doesn't, doesn't reach us um, in a way that's meaningful. So that, that conflict idea from a narrative structure opened my eyes to a whole lot of different things and, and led me down this path of, of joy to say, uh, if I'm having a hard time, if I'm frustrated, angry, sad, lost, uh, uncertain, that is a part of the chapter that makes my story meaningful, that I can look back regardless of what happens and say that was really necessary for mm-hmm. me to move forward and get here, wherever here is. On that note, I kind of then see an, the enthusiast joy, kind of what I'm talking about. So as in Enneagram 7, wing 8 with roots of 5, <laughs> <laughs> for, for the Enneagram people out there, I, dream, I constantly dream of new realities. So this is just where my mind is. Um, I'm strong in those opinions, but I just want to go do stuff. I see it as a blank canvas. That's what I think of as, as an unknown um, in joy. As a painter, I'm not a painter, but if I were a painter, I would hopefully look at a blank canvas and see possibility. I don't know what it's going to become, but it's going to become something. And even if I'm not happy with it, if it's, a, it's my worst piece of art at the end of it, that's as from an artist's perspective and a thinker's perspective, that piece represents something really powerful and meaningful and poignant to me uh, because it's accurate to the time that I painted it. And that's, that's joyful. Um, and that's true. So that, that part of my enthusiast looks at, looks at life in this unknown mire of, of uncertainty and says, there's something coming. I don't know what it is, but I can't wait to find out what, how I'm going to tell that story. And the, and the same kind of thing is true when traveling. I travel a, a good bit when I can. Never know exactly what's going to happen. Who does? <laughs> right. and, and part of my mantra with, with friends and family is, is if it goes terribly wrong, that's going to make a great story when you come back. <laughs> <laughs> because it just does. It just helps. Right. If you go about, like, I went to Paris and nothing went wrong. I knew where to go everywhere. And I spoke perfect, perfect French and everyone loved me. <laughs> Uh, then it would be like, oh, great, get out of here. <laughs> um, so there's this, there's this kind of idea of, of the crazier it gets, the more interesting things become. Doing life stories, I've realized that there is a protection piece that people try to hold on to the uncertain aspects of their life uh, because it's messy. Life is messy, but they, they don't recognize that there's, there's beauty to it. And I want them to be able to dive, dive into it. And I got a mower outside. I'm not sure if you can hear that. <laughs> no problem. I have a little dog who's intent on knocking around his like noisiest toys. <laughs> so, like, like, as soon as I get on these this calls, is how it goes. This it's also goes. one of these things that I want with these conversations that I want people to feel like you and I are sitting at a desk and are sitting at a table and having a cup of coffee yeah. and they're just here with us. And that's, exactly. and yeah. This is, this is what life is, right? Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but please go ahead. You're, go you're ahead. good. You're good. I just wanted to <laughs> clear that up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's one side, the enthusiast side. Then there's another tier to me that, that looks a lot like the role of joy. So even mm-hmm. if I'm not dreaming up new realities that include joyful realities um, and conclusions that I'm content with, um, what is the role of joy? I read a couple of articles of, uh, from a, an author and a couple of other people that, that looked at the idea and say that I don't know what's coming, kind of the same idea. And that could be frightful. That could be scary. That could be anxiety riddled and, and, and constricting, but joy still plays a role. And if I am a person who has joy or takes joy in things, or there are things that give me joy, they will become even more essential in this season of transition. So mm-hmm. being able to cling to these, um, these things that we love doing that bring us joy, the relationships, the, the scenes, the mm-hmm. pictures that we paint in our mind in reality, those things are, are as an intentional practice of joy to say how in this season, I have no idea what's going to happen. And it, it scares me to death. I hate that, 
I need to cling a little closer to a few of these things that, that bring me life and joy. And uh, yeah. that's kind of one aspect that, that is joy in the unknown to me. And then the third kind of tier is uh, childlike joy, which is unquantifiable. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's just out there. It's just mm-hmm. possibility riddled. Um, and one of my best friends has a, a three-year-old daughter and, and she's just like squarely in that toddler zone. And she talks about the future as another day. That's, that's, that's her concept. And he was telling me this story is like on another day, will you do this or do that? Um, and what she means is tomorrow, later, um, <laughs> some point in the future, will you come to my house another day? When, when are we going to be able to continue this play or excitement or, or anticipation be fulfilled? And that's, that is such a, a heartwarming joy kind of moment. You, you think about the, the childlike wonder that so many of us have lost for a variety of reasons, but if we can move a little closer to to a simplified version of life, as difficult or nearly impossible as that might be, to look at life opportunities, encounters, experiences as another day. Like yes. uh, when we wake, yesterday is done, and now we have something new that we can make with what we can um, and create a new reality. One of my favorite phrases, it doesn't quite exactly fit into the, that exact picture, but as a trainer for a long time, for, for 10 years, I would, I would yell at people to get in shape <laughs> and they'd pay me for it some, for some reason. <laughs> I would say something like tomorrow never comes because when midnight hits, it's still now today. So they're, they're, the concept of tomorrow is, is this mythical idea. And I use that to, to say, make your decisions because if we keep saying tomorrow, I'll do it as an idea then we just never will. Yeah. Um, so there's this, and that's uh, two, two pronged. One can say, Hey, get up and let's, let's move forward now while we can call it today. Yes. Uh, but the other, the other side is, is, is saying today is the time that we have and yesterday is gone. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be able to be a person that honors the past. Whether someone gives me a gift and I no longer want it, I can say, I honor you gift. Now I can give you away. Or it's this painful experience or even a joy and say, I honor you. I have joy in that moment, but it's no longer applicable to me right now. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I need to, to figure out what is next for me. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of stuff in those three tiers, but the joy in the unknown to me is is really intentional. It's messy. It's imperfect, but um, huh. it's it's one that I I take comfort in. That there's there's just we don't know what what the what tomorrow is going to bring in the in the theoretical sense of what what, what another day is coming, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but but how we choose to respond to it. And that sounds so cliche, but this this act where we can proclaim victory over over this defeat of what an unknown tomorrow can look like it can be constricting it can be oppressive it can be the enemy and i and i think of of a psalm that i just came across too when kind of looking at this this topic and and david writes in psalm 86 verse 4 bring joy to your servant lord for i put my trust in you and and every every person is going to be a little different in how they respond to that particular idea but David in that particular sense was in a dark place. And he's saying, please bring me joy to lift me out of, of this. And I trust you. So joy, whether higher power, God, Yahweh, whoever, if you have that exterior spirituality, it's this trust that joy will be a part of me wherever I go. And it resonates so deeply of, please give me joy. Like, it's like when we're out there and we're like, I just need a sign that I need to keep going. Yeah. Like that's something I need something that tells me I didn't come this far to just come this far. Yeah. Right. I need to just keep putting myself out there. And sometimes that, that can feel so exhausting, right? You're like, mm-hmm. God, I, do I really have anything else in the tank? Right. And yeah. like you were saying, like some days you're on the couch watching movies and like, yeah. that's what you need that right. day, you know, right. and giving yourself that grace and that space to refill the well, right. So yeah. that you can get back out there and you can get up and you can rise up and you can help other people 
rise up. And I love that idea of what you're really talking about is, is reframing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all doing is saying these difficult, horrible things have happened to us over the last couple of years. Most of it was not of our making. Like we didn't choose any of it. And Mm -hmm. we can choose to see that as like something that's been robbed. We've been robbed of something. Something's been taken from us (laughs) against our will and against our wishes. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, we can choose to say like the painter, well, here's a clean slate and here's a blank canvas. And I get that you didn't want it and you didn't ask for Mm -hmm. it. You didn't pay for it. You didn't wish for it. You didn't go out there and seek it, but that's what we have. Yeah. And that's what we have to work from. And so either we can wallow. And I think a period of wallowing is just fine. I have wallowed plenty <laughs> over yeah. the last couple of years. And then eventually we got to get back up though. Otherwise, what are we doing? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important. I, I've been a stern objector to individuality in this sense, in In that idea, some can hear, we've got to get back up and feel alone and feel like I have to be the one to lift myself up and I don't have the power to do it. And I think you can probably speak to that way better than I can. (laughs) I just don't have the physical, emotional space to be able to do that. I'm I'm tired. tired. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can't do it. So I've been a huge proponent of collective mentalities as we're reframing, having that conversation and and clinging or finding people that you can pour into and can pour it back into you, uh, whether you have it now or not, evaluating what, what is this thing that's happened to me? I'm hurt. I'm either, or I might be better off. I mean, there's a lot of people that are better off after this weird season. And there are a lot of people that are grief stricken, understandably. So the spectrum is huge over 8 billion people. And there's, there's a lot of responses to it. Um, And while you were talking, I was thinking while kind of emphatically nodding, yes, yes, yes. I was also thinking, man, this, this is possibly we're talking about reframing an ability to completely reconstruct a world that we never thought we could construct a world because before it was just status quo. 2019 was beautiful. We just did all these things. This is how our life went. Go to meetings, you know, walk down the street, do it, walk into whatever building you wanted to, how, what freedom we had. Um, But, but now we can, we can come back as we're entering however long it takes entering back into this, this new reality and we can say, well, can't, should we go back to 2019, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and just forget about it? Or can we completely reconstruct a whole new world? And I'm thinking of other stuff that we were frustrated with. So as, as a man, I really, I really am bothered by a passive aggressive comedy. I don't like it, mm-hmm. especially at the expense of other people. And, and I think we need to stop that. And this, that's just one example of how we can completely reframe an, a structure of reality mm-hmm. while we have the time and space to do it. That is another version of the joy and the unknown is, is what are these, what are these uh, concepts and platitudes that, that Gandhi and, and, you know, John Foreman at Switchfoot is saying about, about to make the world that you want to see, you are the world that you want. And those are beautiful ideas, but now we, we can actually do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that we haven't really been able to do because of so, so many things that have been built on top of us. I love that idea of it, thinking of it from a very empowering place. When I was going through my cancer treatments, I decided that very actively, you know, first if people hear you have cancer and they're like, oh, oh, yeah, poor, yeah. Poor Krista. Oh my God. Right. And, I, and there was a part of me, me that was like, poor me, why me? Like, uh, yeah. That's what they're telling me. That's what they're telling me. There were definitely yeah. times of that. And then I decided that I was going to come out of this a better, healthier, stronger human being. And I didn't know how that was going to happen. I had no idea what my treatments were going to do to my body, due to my mind, due to my spirit, my emotions. But I was determined that I was going to become better as a result of the struggle. Mm -hmm. Not that I, and there there is space to hold, like we contain multitudes, right? I can mourn for my life before the pandemic, before cancer, before all these changes. And I can be grateful for what it taught me. And I can be hopeful about the future. And I really had to look at it as 
cancer not happening to me, but happening for me. And like you were saying before, like this idea of like learning and curiosity and like, it's like as a storyteller and as a writer, the best thing that someone can say to you is, and then what happened? Yeah. Right? Like, like yeah. that's because they're invested in the story. Like this mm-hmm. happened, this series of events, you met this person, you went this place and then no one knows what happened next. And they want to know yeah. then what happened. Right. And that's really that idea. I think, I think it gets back to your level of like that childhood, like joy, like that's what the, that's what kids want to know. Like, mm-hmm. and then what happened? Yeah. And what happened next? Right. And that I that <laughs> idea of celebrating, oh, I can't wait. It's like that idea of like wanting to be able to jump up out of bed and like embrace the morning and embrace the day that you're coming into. And it's not always easy. Like some days you know are going to hold a lot of difficulty mm-hmm. and a lot of challenge. And what what can we learn here? What yeah. can we find here? Like yeah. what, you know, what will there be to celebrate mm-hmm. and what can we make to celebrate? Yeah. And I just, yeah. I love that. I love that idea. And I love that joy exists for you on, on so many different levels and so many different planes. And sometimes it's the big things and sometimes it's the really small things that become the big things. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's impossible to tell how all this stuff is going to kind of play out. Um, and that's, that's part of the fun of saying, well, what's next? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's that joy of the unknown in, and as a, as a, a, a believer, um, a Christian believer, I I've, I've also been frustrated with that kind of idea of someone says you have cancer and like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I get where it's coming from. Totally. You know, totally. You, you appreciate the sentiment. You don't know what to say in in that in that no in that one presence. does no yeah. one does <laughs> and, unless you're closely intimate with it yourself you probably don't know how to, to approach that yeah. but I still I still saw a dissonance there that didn't didn't make sense for people of faith uh, or just people in general to to say to do that when in James chapter one says in, uh, consider it joy when you encounter various trials well that seemed that, that doesn't make any sense how do you have trials and say, oh, I'm joyful about this? So I started trying to reframe a little bit and, and I try to as much as possible. When something befalls an individual, especially in my community of faith, instead of saying, I'm so sorry, or oh, I'm praying with you with a somber heart, you know, right. um, it's it's more of almost, I'm, I'm a little jealous of you uh, because you're closer to, the, to Jesus than I am right now, mm-hmm. um, that you're going through something. And through that proximity to pain, you're also closer to what we call joy. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if we believe as believers that Jesus is that, then I think we need to be able to, to say, man, you're so close to him right now. And that's amazing. Uh, and that can take many different forms. And certainly outside of the, of the belief community, there's an idea there that's universal. You are on the cusp of something huge. I can't wait to figure out what's next. And I'm going to be there as much as I can alongside to help you if you need it. If mm-hmm. you don't, I'm going to be cheering you on. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, and if that just, just the base off of your smile, it evokes a completely different tone than saying, Oh, I'm so sorry for your impending death. <laughs> Like, um, oh yeah. thanks I didn't know that's where we were going I didn't yeah, know that's where yeah. the story was because headed they, they <laughs> probably would never say that but that's I'm guessing that's how it might feel sometimes yes like people are thinking oh well this is how it ends huh and I'm like mm. oh no no yeah. no this is where it begins like I'm yes. just getting started and I think it makes a difference I'm in this now that uh I've gone through this health uh, challenge. I'm in all of these different studies, sure. right? And I had a, a lot of complications where I was allergic to a very popular chemotherapy drug. I almost died twice because of an allergy to it. And my lungs fully recovered to the wow. point that my pulmonologist, and my doctors have no idea how it happened because yeah. it shouldn't have happened. I should have been in an ICU on a respirator in the middle of COVID. Mm-hmm. And I should have some kind of scarring or some kind of long-term deficit and I don't. And I think there is this idea of radical healing. It's a mystery to them. It's it's not a mystery to me that Mm -hmm. for me, I felt like it was this practice of joy. It was even in a hospital bed as I'm on one of the breathing machines, not a respirator, but a breathing machine Yeah, and saying, I am going to get myself out of this. Yeah. 
and being able, there is, I don't think that we should ever underestimate the human will to, to change our, our destiny and to change our future yeah. and to change our today of, yeah. I don't care. I didn't care what anybody said about my yeah. diagnosis. Like I was going to get better and I was going to be cured and I was going to beat this no yeah. matter what. And seven months later, after this like insane journey to be care, to be declared completely cancer free mm -hmm. was it, it really, for me, felt like nothing short of a miracle that had an explanation. Yeah. And I, and I think that's really powerful. And I love that idea of like, I'm jealous of you that you get to be closer to joy and yeah. closer to spirit. It's like um, someone that we both know and love and admire. John Booker always says like, I, I don't tell people good luck. Like I say, I wish you courage. Mm. And like that idea of like, that's what you want. I don't want yeah. somebody to tell me, well, good luck. Hope it works out for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want that. It's, it's yeah. give me courage on the journey so that yep. I can shape that journey and I can yeah. shape where I'm going and where I end up. And I wanted to end up on the mountaintop. And if, you know, that's, it's a hard climb, but it was absolutely doable, but it's, it's about your, it's just as much about science and modern medicine as it is sure. about your state of mind. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, mm -hmm. as we're reframing, I think the part of that opportunity is is to look at the ramifications of these throwaway statements that we've come to yes. accustomed to. So good luck, or I'm so sorry for Such you. That's a good point. All those things. We can look at like John Booker's point of I wish you courage. He's taking the same idea of good luck and reframing it to something that would hit you in a different and more meaningful way. Yes. Um, and, and that is a powerful image um, that makes me think of different spelling. But Cory Booker said, you can't steal my joy recently uh, on the floor of the Senate. Yes. And, and, and that idea is taking a broader approach to look at the victory of what joy is and can be while we're deciding to move forward as opposed to the noise, whatever that noise may be in the current moment to say, you can't steal my joy, whoever is trying to steal it, because I've already won and I've already decided I'm going to take the next step. Uh, and and that is a, is a beautiful picture, I think, that, that um, I share uh, yeah. with what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Eric, this has been such a delight. What a wonderful way to start my day. What a wonderful gift um, to give listeners to this podcast of finding our joy in the unknown, whatever the unknown is for us. And we all have an unknown, right? Mm -hmm. Like none of us have it all figured out. We'll never have it all figured yeah. out. And we're all just doing our best, right? Yeah, in, this, really. in this time, we're doing the best we can with what we got right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's true. And finding and finding joy in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if people want to learn more about you, if they want to get in touch with you, they want to learn about what you do, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably the, the website that I mentioned before, finow.com. Um, they can get in contact with me that way or kind of look at what I'm doing or I'm on Instagram and, and all that stuff too. Eric Fisher of Men is my personal account. So if you want to follow me, send a request. I'm, I'm, I'm over there. I'm not doing very much on social media these days, but I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fantastic. And we'll yeah. go ahead and put that all up on the website too, for people um, that, that will um, accompany this episode. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. This was such a gift and such a treat. And I so appreciate you and your time. And I, I wish you joy on the unknown. Well, pun intended, but genuine, the joy has been mine. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Eric. It's fitting that our last interview episode of this first season of Joy Project concludes with the joy of the unknown. A big thank you to Eric for our beautiful conversation and his joyful, hopeful spirit. You can learn more about him and the storytelling work he does through his company, finowr.com. Thanks to all of you for spending part of your day with me and Joy Project. You can find me on Twitter at KristaNYC, on Instagram at KristaRoseNYC, and through the website for this podcast, KristaAvampato.com slash Joy Project, where you can also find links to everything we talk about on the podcast, links to our incredible guests, and links to all of the episodes. I hope you're finding joy in some way every day as we head into the December holidays. Take care of yourself and take care of those in your corner of the world. I'll be back next Tuesday on December 27th with the final episode of this season of Joy Project. I hope you'll tune in to hear my reflections on joy after the 20 interviews of this first season, what I'm thinking about for 2023, and how I'd love to have all of you involved in what's next. Happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, happy Christmas to all who celebrate. 
I hope all of you have a joy-filled week, however you're spending it, and I'll chat with you soon.